Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Worship New Era Reformed. Good to have you all here with us. I think we're going to start changing things. We're going to put announcements to start off the service so that we don't interrupt the flow of worship. So uh, uh, Betsy came up with that idea. We thought it was really good, and we're going to do that again. So just a few announcements before we begin. Uh, Jim Van Sickle's handout from uh, General Synod is available. I printed 75. I think that'll be enough, but we'll see. If you want all that information that he gave at the Congregational Forum, it's over there, okay? It's right on the windowsill outside in the Fellowship Hall. Also, uh, profession of faith classes and membership classes. There are two uh, handouts to see how many we would have who would be willing or want to uh, join or do their professions of faith. So that's out there. If we do the profession of faith, I have to order some books. I probably would have to order some books anyway for the membership class. But if anybody's interested, please sign up, and then you can talk to me, and we'll, we'll figure out what we got for numbers. And then uh, R&R, Read and Review, will be on after service. And today we have communion, so it should be a blessed day today. We've been going through a sermon series on First and Second Peter, and we're in Second Peter now, and we go to chapter 2, so there's a little typo in the, the, the overhead's correct, the, the bulletin is wrong, we're up to chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And in there, uh, the challenge of false teachers comes up, something that we don't really talk about often in the church, but is a problem throughout Scripture, and so I want us to take a moment, we're going to calm ourselves, re- be still before the Lord, and then I'm going to read from Psalm 37, so let us quiet our hearts. Hear these words from Psalm 37. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, intent on putting them to death. But the Lord will not leave them in the power of the wicked or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Hope in the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. And this relates to what Peter talks about today. The living God greets you, the one who saves you from your sins and sends his son and gives you the spirit to live a life worthy of his calling, greets you with his love and his mercy this morning. Amen. As the Lord greets us, let's stand up and take a moment and greet each other. Good morning. 30 seconds ago, I was just sitting quietly and realized uh, that I get to work next to a a lighthouse every day as we're about to sing my lighthouse uh, out at Mac Woods. And it never really dawns on you how powerful that can be when the when the storm clouds are there and the and the waves are crashing and the winds are blowing and just the the safety that that must bring to someone out on a ship. I've never been out on a ship to experience that, but just to think about that lighthouse as that pillar that's always there is really incredible. So we're gonna sing because uh, the Lord and you know Jesus is our pillar and our lighthouse. <clears throat> Peace. 
Dear Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for that simple gift that you never let go of us. Even when we feel lost, even if it seems like there's no one there, you are there. God, you are good. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let me make sure I'm on. Before we go to God in prayer, just a, a thank you to those who helped out with the memorial service for Sharla Vanderven. That's a name for some of you that goes way back. Um, so that she came back to be uh, buried in New Era, and family had a little service there. You may know Helene Dirksy, that was her sister. So uh, thank you for helping with uh, lunch and uh, sound and all that that was involved with that. So thank you for that. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you have called us, that you have gathered us to bless us with your presence through the word, through the sacrament, through the spirit, through faith in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you this morning. Forgive us for our many sins that we have committed this week, the lust we've pursued, the idols that we have loved and put alongside Jesus, the things that have distracted us. Forgive us, Lord, for not doing the work that you've called us to do faithfully. We ask for your forgiveness and cleansing so that we may move forward in the freedom that is in Jesus Christ to serve you wholeheartedly. Father, we pray for your world as we know there's always chaos around any corner. We ask, Lord, that your sovereign reign would quelch problems between nations, that wars would not continue that there would be relative peace and that your name would be glorified through all of this. We pray for our leaders of this country. Give them your spirit. Give them wisdom to govern and to guide and to lead. Here at New Era Reformed, give us wisdom on how we should lead. Help us to stick to your word like almost like a duct tape or super glue. Help us never to leave your word. Give us strength in how we talk to one another, how we love one another. Lord, help us to be a people that glorify you. As we plan to participate in the Holy Supper with you, give us strength in the guilt of our sin to be healed. May it be medicine for us. May you bless us with your presence. Speak to us. Help us in our need. We also pray for all those who have medical issues, whether it's recovering from surgery, getting ready for surgery, tests coming up, hospital visits, doctor visits related to health issues. Lord, may your peace be over those folks here who are, have all that coming up. And Lord, we thank you for using us despite all of our weaknesses, all of our sins, you use us as your instruments, and that's what we want. We want to be servants of the Most High God. So this morning, change us and mold us and bless us. Thank you for this time. Thank you for everyone here. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. It's now time for our offering. So we have two. We have the general fund offering. And then after that will be the love offering. Can I have deacons come forward, please? Today's passage is 2 Peter, chapters one, uh, verses 1 through 10, chapter 2. This is what Peter's going to talk about today. Uh, we're doing this in two parts because the whole chapter is about it. But I realized also as I was getting ready for this, is this is not a common topic that you would hear um, and trying to communicate this, I can see why. It's hard to talk about this. So, so if you would turn to me, chapter 2 of Second Peter, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to go through 10a, which is the middle of the verse of chapter 10. It's all tied together, but there's a lot to take in. So, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. 
Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, if He did not spare the ancient world when He brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, our preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if He rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the the flesh and despise authority. This is the reading of God's Word. Thanks be to God. Max was a nice enough guy. He introduced himself and showed up kind of out of nowhere and then was quickly involved in every Sunday. He had white hair that was slicked back, carried a handlebar mustache or groomed a mustache like that, had a southern drawl, had a cane, short guy. He was very encouraging, pastor, I like your sermons, well done, all that kind of stuff. And I thought God had maybe brought him there to be blessed, to find a home away from home or whatever, wherever he was traveling. Then one Sunday, he pulled me aside and said, hey, pastor, I have a question for you. I said, okay. You never know what's going to happen at coffee. Pastor, I've been reading about David. He had concubines, and he was a man after God's own heart. So I was praying for concubines. Why can't I have concubines? There's really no preparation for that kind of question. And it's easy to pick on Max. He was a nice enough guy. Uh, But the question is, is how do we do that to Scripture, right? So I think I said something to the effect of David had many great qualities, but his lust for women was not one of them. Shortly after that, Max disappeared, and I found out from the ladies in Coffee Break that he had made some propositions to the widows in Coffee Break, and they turned him down, and so he left. False teachings. They are a clear and present danger to the church. And in his loneliness, Max was bending Scripture for his desires. And this is often the nursery for heresies, a straying human heart. Now, we often like to delude ourselves and think heresies or something or false things, they happen out there. They come from some egg-headed professor who brings it in or whatever. Or we think those false teachings happen at those big churches. Many heresies begin at the dinner table, and we have to be aware of that. Normally well-intentioned, these false teachings come from among us, and I don't know if you caught that in verse 1. There are often people we know and love, maybe even ourselves. We get these notions, and we start teaching these things that just are not true. And heresies start as a scratch and quickly become an infection. Now, with the rise of the internet, various technologies, social media, there are countless competing narratives always vying for our hearts and our minds. We're bombarded with over-information. And we're so busy, do we really have time to sit down in God's Word and be able to figure out what's a false teaching and what's not? So I think that makes us more vulnerable than ever in church history because we're so distracted with all that's going on around us. Every generation of believers has to deal with this reality. There will be false teachers and false teachings, heresies. Peter has given us some wonderful truth here in chapter 2 that I hope we will take to heart. Because as he's told us before, we will do well to pay attention to that word, the trustworthy word. 
the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from these trials, and he also knows how to punish false teachers for bringing those trials and temptations. And as we can see here in this passage, there is a fiery fate waiting for them. Peter begins with something rather profound. I don't know if you caught that. Go back to verse 1 if you have your Bible open. There were false prophets among the people. What does he mean by that? He's really referencing Old Testament. There were false prophets among the people in the Old Testament, just as there will be false teachers among you or among us. There's something rather significant there. So there's two things. Uh, the prophetic office in the Old Testament is completed or fulfilled in Christ. He's the great high king, priest, and prophet. Okay? Now, we can be prophetic or priestly with our words or whatever, but we're not actually being a prophet. So false teaching, number one, anybody who says they're a prophet, run the opposite way because that office is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so in the New Covenant... It's teachers. It moves from prophets to teachers. So just in that little verse, he says that. But then I think the scariest part of this is that where do these false teachers come from? Just as there will be false teachers among you. These false teachers come from the people of God, and we have to be wary of that. These false teachers do a few things. They deny their master, the Lord. And they don't deny him by saying, we don't believe in Jesus or I'm not coming to church anymore. That's, that's easy. What they do is they say they believe in Jesus, but then don't live the way he prescribes in his word. So they'll deny him by their behavior. The word deny means to denounce or ignore their master. And then he describes their denial by saying it's a word for self-abandonment. That means lack of self-control in sexual matters. Now, this should, that should strike us because Peter had spent a lot of time in chapter 1 talking about verses 5 to 7. Since we are, have escaped the corruption of the world through faith in Christ, make every effort to add to your faith goodness of character, from goodness of character to knowledge, to knowledge, self-control. So I think in theory, my, my theory is that he put that character list together to counter the false teachers. This is what they're teaching the opposite of this. This is what you should be building up, okay? Now, many in the church will follow these false teachers and their false teachings because many of us like to give in to our self-abandonment. Many supposed Christians think that God's ways are just too restrictive. I use the illustration of the the astronaut who wants to cut his tether because he wants to be free. He'll be free for as long as his oxygen holds out. And then he's dead after that. And that's what happens when we live our own way. A follower of Christ is supposed to follow Christ, his ways. And false teachings want to deviate from that. These false teachers will bring destruction upon themselves and those who follow them. Why? Because when these teachers detach themselves from God and his word... They die in their sins. There's only one way out of sins, and that's through Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other way. False teachings most often allow one to give in to their desires, whatever they may be. But heavenly citizens are supposed to mourn their sins, and they know their need for constant repentance. So Peter's going to say to us that God is not silent on that matter. Their judgment is not idle. He uses really interesting words, and their destruction is does not sleep. God will intervene to punish and ultimately judge these false teachers in the end. Fire is their future. So I thought it'd be appropriate for us to do a real practical true-false heresy test. We're going to see how many... All right, so let me just caveat this. You may be in error. A heretic likes to stay in their error. You can get out of the error if you're in error, right? So let's have a little bit of fun with this interactive. All I need is a true or false from you. Feel free to shout it out. You don't have to raise your hands, just false. So I have a list here. So let's start with the first one. True or false? Most people are basically good. Any trues? There was only a couple falses there. There's more than that. Any trues? 
Ma- yeah. <laughs> Basically, what does he say to the rich ruler in Mark chapter 10? No one is good but God alone. So we are totally depraved and lost, and without the Spirit we can do no good. Now, ethics gets into distinctions of good. There are people who have done good for society and all that stuff, putting in programs or running organizations. That's not the kind of good we're talking about in Scripture. We're talking about saving and spiritual good. Okay? All right. Next one. True or false, the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation. Ooh, we heard some falses there. Ooh, I like it. We got some heretics. It's nice. I knew it. So that came from Ligonier's. Uh, Ligonier's survey they did in 2018, most evangelicals would say this one is false, but it is true. If you break one part of the law, you break all of it. So, and then the other part is God is infinite and we're not. So one sin against God is an infinite payment that we cannot pay back with our finite being. So the smallest sin does deserve eternal damnation. And then I got to ask, what's a small sin? True or false? Watching worship at home is the same as attending worship services. It's false, yeah. It's false. Uh, Worship requires your physical presence because we're body and soul. Never mind the fact that we have those pastors that say, do not forsake gathering together and all of that. Okay? So how are you looking so far? More of a heretic than you thought? All right, next one. True or false, God is concerned with my every decision. True? Yes, true. We have passages like 2 Corinthians 10 that talk about how we are to take captive every thought, right, and submit it to Christ, okay? Uh, True or false, Jesus is the first and greatest created being by God. I hear some doubt out there. There's no maybes, true or false? False. John 1, the Word became flesh, right? He was with God and was God. Now, why does John use the past tense? Well, you'll have to dig into that some more. But God, Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Okay? True or false? This is a fun modern one. I need a conversion experience to have true faith. Yeah, it's false. Uh, We see a lot of conversion experiences in Scripture, but we forget that in the book of Acts, for example, that was the first generation of the church. So there are no other examples of that before that, right? You have to go back to the Old Testament to see how covenantal families grow faith to understand that it doesn't require a conversion experience. You can be raised in a Christian home, somehow the spirit works that the faith is there from an early age and then they grow into it the last one i want to end with is one with a little bit of humor in it a church is successful true or false based upon the three b's butts building and budget yes so successful in american sense is butts building and budget But for the church, you can be a dying congregation as far as numbers go, but be very successful in that you're faithful. You have a strong prayer group and other things going on. And just because your numbers and budget are declining doesn't mean you're not successful. So we have to be careful with the words that we use. All right, so how many heretics do we have amongst us? Remember, you can always change your errors. So what this gets to is, If we have been bought with the blood of Christ, He owns us. We are His. That's a good place to be, but that means we actually have to work at knowing the truth. And we started this off, the sermon series off with that, where Peter talks about you have to know God more and know about God more. Your mind and your heart and your will have to bend towards Him. And that requires you to dig in, to study to do things so that you know what is false and what is true. We are to make every effort to learn the right thinking, that word is orthodoxy, and the right living, orthopraxis. 
if we know the right things, but it doesn't affect our living, then it doesn't matter. It has to make the, the walk from the head to the heart, okay? And the Spirit has given us everything we need to live a godly life. We just have to want that godly life more than the world around us. We have to want it more than the sins that affect us, and that's often hard. We have to see that Jesus is far more precious than the world, our desires, the things that we covet, the things that we make idols out of. And that's often hard because we're broken. So I think there are, I have four tips. There are three tips in here from Peter that are helpful. Uh, sorry on the sermon outline. I came across the fourth on Saturday. So everything was already printed. So there are four tips coming up, okay? The first one is we are to be wary of new teachings, okay? A great example of this is a teaching called dispensationalism. John Nelson Darby introduced it in the 1830s, 1840s, and he had the right intentions. He wanted to systematize all the prophecy of Scripture into a succinct system. So if you have ever read the Left Behind series or have heard of that, that is dispensationalism. But that's new. The greatest theologians don't read Scripture the way dispensationalism does. And so there's a, there's a conflict there. <clears throat> We get words like rapture from dispensationalism, and we are concerned about the Antichrist and all of that. I th the, the, the negative of dispensationalism, it makes you always think about the future without worrying about being faithful in the present. And that's, that's the big critique of it. The other thing I personally have a problem with is it makes you a poor reader of Scripture. You're proof testing all these things to find out how to predict the next age instead of how does this passage in Joel... How does that relate to the time that it was written? And then how does it relate to us today? So that's number one, wary of new teachings. Number two, judgment is real. There will be a judgment. There is a hell. It's coming. So any teaching that says, in the end, love wins, that's a false teaching. And that was, uh, I, was I played bass guitar at, uh, for a while in my first year of seminary at Mars Hill at its peak. I mean, we had... There were some amazing things that happened there, right? We had 50 people on the worship team. Four rotations, two paid leaders. I mean, eight guitar players, five bass players, 10 drummers. Right? It was just pretty amazing, the, the amount of gifts that were there. But that pastor, Rob Bell, strayed, and he was teaching universalism. And now he's not pastoring anymore. So anything that denies judgment is a problem, okay? Here's the third one. If the teaching is about loose living, avoid it. God wants us to live self-controlled lives, okay? And then the second part that comes out of that is if the teaching despises the authority of the church. I don't care what your pastor says. What does he know? Well, not much, but I know something. And that despising of authority means rebellion. Submission is key to the Christian life. So those last two parts, if it's about loose living, then avoid it. And if it despises the authority of the church, then avoid it. God would not be just if he does not have consequences for sin. He would actually be denying himself. He's holy and just. Yes, he's good. And his love and mercy are under his goodness. But he's also just, and you can't have it both ways. You can't say God is all loving and he's holy but he's not going to discipline for sins. Of course he does. We can't be in his presence if we don't have Jesus Christ in his atoning sacrifice. So God is just. God has also given us everything we need to avoid the fiery fate of false teachers. So now I want to go into what Peter does here and look at the historical evidence of this. It's rather amazing. I went back and read Genesis 18 and 19 and 6 when the flood happened. It's pretty amazing, the details in there. Now, the people of the earth were corrupt in all their ways, so God said to Noah, build a boat. So for those of you who think that's cool, that's my one Colton Dixon reference, build a boat. Noah did everything that God commanded. In other words, he obeyed God's word, right? And when the floods came, Noah and his family were delivered from the flood. After the second covenant with Abraham, God appears by the, the trees of Mamre to Abraham. 
with two angels. And as they sit down in fellowship, God says, shall I not tell Abraham what I'm about to do? He's going down to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it and make it ashes because of its sexual deviancy. Now, there's this really painstaking interaction here with Abraham and God. Abraham, if your servant may ask, would you destroy the city if you find 50 righteous people in that city? And God answers, I will not destroy it if I find 50. And this goes on for like a whole page, making their way all the way down to 20. And finally, God says, if I find 10 righteous people in that city, I will not destroy it. Now, what does God know that Abraham doesn't know? There are not 10 righteous people in those two cities, right? Who was there? There were three, and he still delivered them. It was Lot and his two daughters. Now, four were rescued from the city, but Lot's wife did what? She looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. So I always thought, this is one of those passages that makes God look like a ruthless dictator. I would have looked back to see, look at that, look at those things coming down from the sky, right? <laughs> right? So what's going on there? Well, we have to go to Luke 17. If you bear with me for a minute, this is kind of fun. Luke 17, 31 to 32. Listen to this if you don't have your Bibles there. Luke 17, 31 to 32. This is about the end times. On that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. And likewise, no one who is in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife? So when you're on the rooftop, you're not working, you're relaxing. And so when Christ comes again and the archangel sounds, the cloud rider comes, we'll all know it. The lightning will go across the sky. What Luke is warning us is do not go back down for your possessions. Don't get the family album picture and then run out to see Christ. And the same thing if you're working, you're in the field and Christ comes, drop your work. Why? Because what's coming is so much greater than what you have now. To be in relationship in the new heaven and new earth will be far superior to anything we could imagine or dream of. And if we go back, we're stuck in our old life. And so what happens with Lot, his wife, she really liked her life in Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's a problem. That's unholy. So when she turned back, it wasn't because she was in awe of God's work. She was missing her life. Peter has done, or has given us, historical biblical evidence of how God delivers his righteous and punishes the wicked. The Lord knows how to rescue his people from these temptations of false teachings. He also knows how to punish the wicked because God is just. Now, I also want to say that the righteous here don't get lost on that term. This is not someone who is perfect. Someone who is righteous is someone who is trying to believe the best they can with all their weaknesses in Jesus because what happens to Noah after the flood? Nothing good. You have to, I'll let you read it, but it has to do with his son, Ham. Nothing good comes out of that. And then the same thing with Lot. After deliverance from Sodom and Gomorrah, something bad happens there. These are not perfect people, but they do believe. They trust and they submit to Christ. So when the Scripture says that he delivers righteous people, he means people who believe. Who are not, they're not perfect. He rescues his faithful and all will have to give an account because there is judgment coming. But for the faithful, they will be welcomed into eternal dwellings because of the Lamb who is slain. And that's really critical. We will, we will be in eternal glory because of the work of Christ. We also have to give an account of how we have lived. For the false teachers, they will have to give an account and they will be paid back for the harm that they have caused. But for the faithful, praise and joy await for them. This is, this is important stuff we don't hear much about. In 2000, an Illinois scientist named William Walsh studied the strands of hair from the body of the famous classical composer Ludwig van Beethoven. 
By studying those strands of hair, Dr. Walsh discovered that Beethoven's body had 100 times the normal amount of lead. So with the evidence that he had, he concluded that Beethoven died an untimely death at age 57 because of lead poisoning. Now, what's interesting about the story is Beethoven used to go to this mineral spa, and they have detected high levels of lead in that over time. He went there in order to relax. The reality was the very thing he thought was bringing him relief and relaxation was actually slowly killing him, was poisoning him to death. This is what false teaching is like. It sounds really good. It's very tempting. Oh, it, oh it makes sense. My, my heart wants it. Remember, we're here to deny ourselves before the cross. I, I, I just, I know, it just sounds so good. It make me feel good. But that's a slow poisoning away from God. Are you willing to put the work in to notice what false teachings are and what the truth is, the orthodox teaching of the church? So where can you begin to even go there? Well, let's start with our Reformed creeds and confessions. You can, you can get a book and order online. It's like $12.99. You can get it on Amazon. It'll be here in one day. And you can start reading one article to learn. What, what do we say about the Word of God? What do we say about sacraments? Why is that important? You could come to R&R, where we talk about all these things. We try to cover a variety of topics just to grow. And you can also come to prayer meeting. You actually have to work at this, though. It's not going to just come by osmosis. And Sunday morning is not enough. You have to do it outside of church as well. God is calling us to follow Him and pursue Him with everything we've got. He's willing to deliver us when we stand firm. I can't imagine what it was like for Noah when he was building that ark and all the criticism he got. And I can't imagine what Lot was like living in Sodom and Gomorrah, out of all places. But he delivers his faithful people. And justice is not always our timing. What does uh, Toby Mac say? He's never early and he's never late. That's right. He comes exactly at the right time to deliver us. And he will also judge those and punish those who have strayed. He has proved this over and over again. And the comfort here is that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and temptations that come from false teachings. And he also knows how to punish those false teachers on the day of judgment. Amen. And let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It's not an easy word, but we thank you, Lord, for it, because by it we can grow, we can become aware, we can become awake. There are many distractions. Help us to focus on you and your word. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song, Is He Worthy? The title is wrong in the bulletin. Please stand and sing with us. Me
As we stand before you as your servants, so unworthy, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. And those times of your discipline, those times of discipline help us grow and become the people you have called us to be. May we learn to give you praise and honor and glory on the mountains and in the valleys, for you are with us, with us every minute of every day. And it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. So every time we have the Lord's Supper, I try to bring another uh, angle onto helping us understand the sacrament and how this all works. So we have some Brief, responsive reading. I think you'll find it uh, manageable. Brief instructions concerning the Lord's Supper. How many sacraments are there? What are they? So since we're going to apply false teachings, there are others who say there are more than two, just so you know that. Okay. Why did Christ appoint these two sacraments? So do you see what happens here? God is blessing us in these simple elements. 
through the Spirit, He is changing us, healing us. If we are sick, maybe in our sin, He is working on us through these sacraments. That's why they're so significant. So, let's say this together. When you partake, we bear witness that our Lord Jesus was sent by the Father into the world, that He took upon Himself our flesh and blood, and that He bore the wrath of God on the cross for us. Amen. Who should come to the supper? God will surely receive at His table all His covenantal people, young and old, the hurting, those in need of care, the doubting, and, his, and those who are less than faithful. For this supper is like medicine for the sickly sinner. The church is a hospital for the healing of sinners. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. I think I have it up here. Now, I always pick this one. We're just going to say it right out of Matthew because we've all learned different versions. So let us just say this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts if we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let us ask for God's blessing over the elements. I don't think I have anything else up there, right? Let's ask for God's blessings over these elements. Our Heavenly Father, we ask for the Spirit to bless the grain of the ground, the bread, and the fruit of the vine as a sign and seal of the new covenant. As we take and we remember the Lord dying on the cross for us and being raised, bless these elements for us as we partake as your church. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. When he had the, the last supper, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. And then after the supper, he took the wine and poured it and said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Through this, you will have access to my heavenly father. You will have new life. You will have eternal dwellings. You will have hope through death. And you will have peace all through his precious blood. So as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper together, Remember, we're going to take it together, so please wait. Can I have elders come forward as we distribute the elements? Here I go right here. Let's start this way. You guys made it first. <laughs> Please wait as we take together. People of God, take, eat, and remember that the Lord gave his body for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. And now to the cup. Once again, please wait as we distribute.
Dad the Black Christ. John the Black Christ. Al the Black Christ. That's me. Ann the Black Christ. Bob the Black Christ. Jim the Black Christ. People of God, take, drink, and remember the Lord shed His blood for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Thank you. Thank you. I think she needs two. Let's close in prayer here. We have a song and a blessing, so don't go anywhere. I know this gets confusing sometimes. We like to change things around to keep everybody honest. So, so just hold tight. Listen to this prayer. It's a Puritan prayer about the Lord's Supper. God of all good, I bless you for this means of grace. Teach me to see in it thy loving purposes and the joy and strength of my soul. You have prepared for me a feast, and though I am unworthy to sit down as a guest, I wholly rest on the merits of Jesus, and I hide myself beneath his righteousness. When I hear his tender invitation and see his wondrous grace, I cannot hesitate but must come to you in love, and by your spirit enliven my faith, rightly to discern and spiritually to apprehend the Savior. While I gaze upon the emblems of my Savior's death, May I ponder why he died and hear him say, I gave my life to purchase yours, presented myself an offering to expitiate your sins. Shed my blood to blot out your guilt, opened my side to make you clean, endured your curses to set you free, bore your condemnation to satisfy divine justice. Oh, may I rightly grasp the breadth and length of this design. Draw near. Obey, extend the hand, take the bread, receive the cup, eat and drink, testify before all men that I do for myself gladly in faith, reverence and love, receive my Lord to be my life and strength, nourishment, joy, delight. In the supper I remember his eternal love, boundless grace, infinite compassion, agony, cross, redemption, and receive assurance of pardon, adoption, life, glory. As the outward elements nourish my body, so may your indwelling spirit invigorate my soul until the day when I hunger and thirst no more and sit with Jesus at his heavenly feast. Amen. Let us stand and sing. And it, uh, this course might be new and we actually have it twice in a row. So the team will sing the first time and we welcome you to join us on the second time. We receive your blessing, we receive your grace, as we walk in the light shining from your face. May the peace that we give change the way that we live. We receive your blessing as we
Receive a blessing from God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go in the peace of the Lord.